Welcome back to my masterclass series. Today we're going to do something a bit different. We're going to talk about the violin accessories surrounding the instrument, literally. So chin rests, shoulder rests, all those things that form your setup and the way that you interact and connect with your instrument. So I'll present some options and thoughts on finding the right solution for you. So there's a golden triangle of parameters when speaking about your setup. We have stability, which is balance. We have freedom and we have looseness. Now, stability, meaning that you don't want the feeling that the instrument's gonna get away from you or fall or slip in some way. Uh, in terms of freedom, we want the ability to move the instrument around. We don't want it cemented to ourselves. Um, different music will bring out different sorts of physicality and you want the instrument to be free so that you can get into the right position that the music demands and looseness of course we don't want our shoulder to be tense we don't want to stabilize and balance the instrument through force so the problem is that too much or too little of any of these parameters can cause serious problems so each of us is sort of on a quest to balance those three properties and uh, experiment to find the right solution. Now, you probably know people that look like they were born to play the violin, and maybe they have never even thought about these things for very long. And obviously, uh, your physique and your genetics, and also the way you were taught, your technique, your habits, that all plays a part. Um, but for most of us, we are going to be experimenting a lot with our setup, and that could be a long process that involves many changes, um, manipulating different angles, and experimenting with various products. In fact, the more you look into it, the more you'll start to realize the importance of bone structure, um, slope of the shoulders, length of the arms, length of your neck. So some of the experimentation is going to be inevitable. But the important thing is not to get lost in the sea of options, especially today. And you have to figure out what the cause of the problem is, rather than trying to optimize something that shouldn't exist. I'm actually very frustrated by the dogmatism in the music world, where teachers will foist upon their students the setup that they think is best, the setup that they use, or the setup that their teachers used and flat out reject any experimentation. Um, for example, the teachers that require no shoulder rests. This is, I think, very irresponsible um, at best and lazy and selfish at worst. Anyway, I'm gonna show you the different tools that I've used over the past 10 years or so, and there's definitely been an evolution in my setup. So um, I'll make some comments on physicality and I'll offer some tips that help me avoid pain and confusion regarding the setup. So let's start with shoulder rests and I'll describe the three that I've used throughout the years, the three main ones at least, and their pros and cons and why I ended up where I am currently. So for in at least five, 10 years, I used the uh, Wolf Forte Secundo. This is a pretty good shoulder rest. It's very customizable. You can bend this material the neoprene grippy part on, on the back is pretty durable. I mean, it's you can see it's worn here, but this was used quite a bit. The feet on this are pretty rubbery. I found in the end that they're a little too soft and I feel like they probably contact the instrument too much and that there might be a overly dampening effect. But I like this one compared to the straight version of it because this little bump here digs into the top of your chest and it provides some nice support that way. As you can see, I've modified it. You know, I have this little leather pad here so that it doesn't dig into my instrument because I wanted to make this as low as possible. So there are some little design quirks, but overall it's pretty solid and affordable. Now I moved to this one, which is the Bon Musica, because obviously it's very customizable it's like a little Frankenstein. The special feature of this one actually is this hook. 
and this hugs your shoulder and goes around your shoulder. And what it did for me was it created stability for when I shift very high, on the, especially on the G string. And it solved the problem of the violin kind of sliding in front of me when I'm shifting that high. So this kind of stabilized the violin and obviously very customizable. I do prefer the feet on this one. They're a little denser and a little smaller and still very grippy. And it's, it's overall quite well made, although I find that there are too many moving parts here that you need to tweak over the years. The main reason that I fell out of love with this one was because it's very heavy for a shoulder rest. And I was beginning to experience pains in my shoulder. And I think that's partly because of the weight, but also because this shoulder rest puts the violin in a very particular position and it doesn't allow for as much freedom as I would have liked. Now, the one I use now, which is the Pirastro Kolfka Rest, I was pretty skeptical of it at first because it's prohibitively expensive and, you know, it, there was a lot of hype around it. But after trying it, I immediately noticed how incredibly light it is. And that was such a relief for my shoulder. It's, it's like you're playing with nothing at all. And I find that it's quite well designed for how minimalistic it is. Um, the feet are absolutely fantastic. They're super grippy, but they're not kind of soft at all. So you feel a really solid con and, uh, connection with the instrument that's not dampening. Even the bottom of the feet have these little uh, pads on them that are the actual part that's touching the instrument. So they've thought of, you know, minimal contact. And obviously all these holes are taking mass out of the, out of the structure so that it's even lighter. Another cool thing about this one is that it's bendable. The spruce that they use is some interesting composite, which allows you to very carefully bend this uh, to, to an extent. I actually put it against a round pole and um, put some cloth in between and gently bend it because if you have pressure points that you exert too much force on, it could crack like any wood. And I was able to replicate this kind of hook feeling. So obviously it's not as extreme as this one, but I, add, I added these little uh, foam pads to enhance the stability and it really does the job beautifully. Most importantly, it freed my shoulder and it just feels like you're not playing with anything. So the overall feeling is, is, is just far more free. So I don't see myself going back to either of these anytime soon. So now let's look at chin rests. And these are the ones that I've used throughout the years and one more that's on my violin currently. This one is a Vermeer, I believe, Vermeer model. And I got it because it's taller and, you know, I have a long neck. And for anybody with a long neck, you should definitely experiment with taller uh, chin rests because building height from the bottom can be very damaging. You can look at violinists like Arnold Steinhardt, who has a very tall chin rest. So that solution does work for many people. And the pad I have on top of here is, is from Mach 1. Mach 1 also make a shoulder rest, but they happen to make this fantastic self-adhesive foam pad. Uh, I find that it's the perfect thickness, like it's not too mushy, like a Strad pad, and it provides a lot of grip and stability without feeling like you're floating on something. So I tend to put it on uh, all the chin rests, as you'll see. The next one I used was called the Cradle. And the Cradle is a very interesting little invention. You use a little um, hex key that allows you to change all of the angles of the cup of the chin rest. So you can tilt it, you can move it this way, up and down, kind of in all directions. So that was naturally very attractive to me because I was messing around with chin rests so much to find you know, the, the comfortable position uh, considering the length of my neck. And I used this for a while. I actually used it backwards. I found that it was easier. Ultimately, I abandoned it because I find that, the, strangely enough, the cup size is very small, and it's. I, I wish they went with kind of a very standard Guarneri or Strad model chin rest. But I highly recommend that you experiment with something like this because even if it doesn't work out for you, you learn a lot about what the important angles are in the chin rest and how the chin rest provides support and how your particular, the, the shape of your chin um, 
interacts with the surface. So uh, I don't regret getting this one and I used it for at least two, three years. This is a more recent one that I've used and I do like it very much. It's called the Wave, Wave 1. And there are three different models and they're, they're pretty unique. And they offer this kind of hump right here that allows you to stabilize the instrument with the help of your chin a bit more. I like the big cup that it has here. And as you can see, I put the Mach 1 pad on it as well. And Mach 1 also makes this little leather cover for the feet of the chin rest because prolonged exposure to your skin and sweat and all that, eventually it gets all kind of nasty. So this is a nice addition. I recommend you go on this website and check out his different models. He even sends you all of them if you buy one and you get to try them all out and just send back the ones you don't like. And now onto the one that I currently use. Uh, this is a Stradivari model chin rest made by Goetz, which is a company in Germany. And I like the shape of it. It's kind of a smaller cup, but it's very curvy. So it fit quite well with my chin and it has a nice hump here that stabilizes the instrument. In general, I am going away from building height on the chin rest. Instead, I've adjusted my technique so that I'm supporting the instrument in the hand a bit more. So that allows me to not totally rely on the accessories for stability. Now, one really cool thing that I recommend to everyone is to build an extra little hump here. And you can see that I did that with these little red pads. It's still a work in progress. I'm gonna make a more permanent solution later, but for now I stabilize them with a thick rubber band. And it really stabilizes the instrument under your chin, hooking it under your jawbone. And I found that this was the perfect thing to get me off of this craze of high chin rests. So I'm able to have a low chin rest, but stable instrument. And on top, I put this leather pad that I super glued to the little red pads. I would use this Mach 1, but since the adhesive destroys the wood, I didn't want to destroy this nice chin rest that I bought. There's another product called the Chin Rest Lip, which is basically like this. It's a, a bar adhesive that provides this jaw bone support. I found that it's kind of expensive, but if you want a ready-made solution, they offer those in three different heights, so you can check that out. So here I can show you what I've used in terms of pads and fabric support, either on top of the instrument or on top of your shoulder. This one, many people know about, it's the non-slip material that you put under a rug and you can cut it into any shape. And that's really good. Some people just use a little bit of this on their shoulder. You know, if you don't have a long neck, you can totally get away with just playing with this. Many different uses for that. Also, you can get a piece of leather and that can be really nice, just draped across your shoulder sandwiching the violin like this on the chin rest and under the instrument. Uh, so many uses for that. I got these little pads backstage at a concert somewhere and they've, they're infinitely useful. So I find that they're very good as little modifiers. You tweak the shape of something, but you don't want to overall change its contour. So these are very useful because they're dense, but not too soft and they're small so you can kind of create a shape with them uh, and that's what I did under my chin rest. These two were designed to go on top of the chin rest so this is uh, I think called the chin comforter and I tried this I'm not a big fan because it's just it's very soft and again I want that solid feeling of my chin on the instrument making contact and this is the Mach 1 that I mentioned and I really think it's the best. I bought so many of these in case the company goes out of business or stops making them. Uh, and then of course, this is the red sponge. It comes in different thicknesses and different consistency, density. This is the thicker one. And I find that it's very good for trying things out and creating shapes. So very much like this one, but different size and for a different purpose. One thing that I used to do, which 
I'm on the fence about at this point, whether I can recommend it or not, is you cover the surface with rubber cement, uh, like Elmer's or something. So you keep lathering on layers and letting them dry. And once you completely cover the surface and it's dried, it creates a very sticky surface, but it doesn't leave any residue. It's basically like rubber. And so a lot of people use that and they just kind of stick it right under the instrument. But I have a feeling it might wear on the varnish. I can't prove that. And I know people that use them on strads. So that's something you can try. Here are a couple of other things I tried instead of shoulder rests. Of course, we have this sort of foam block and you can get it in a rectangular form or there are some that are sold in a curvy shape to follow the shoulder. Ultimately, I found that there was a lack of stability when everything is so soft and kind of fluffy and you feel like everything is on air and this, you want this sort of solidity, you want a connection to the instrument. So if you're gonna use this, I recommend that you don't use it in a way where the instrument no longer touches your collarbone, right? Even when you use a shoulder rest, your instrument should still touch your collarbone. If the instrument is raised, I find that this disconnection comes at a cost in comfort and playing over the years. Now this other one, I'm not even sure where I got this. It's a little more dense foam, which I like. So it has the advantages of being grippy and has a very, very slight give to it. Finally, two quirkier items. This is part of a, uh, a two-piece contraption that a man from England sent to me. It says uh, US and UK patent here, carved in with a knife, which is fantastic. This is the part I saved because the other part was kind of ridiculous. And basically this goes under the instrument and attaches here with little zip ties. So it provides this grip and support on the collarbone, which lifts the instrument very slightly and stabilizes it, but it doesn't overall change the feeling of playing as a shoulder rest would. So for people that want to play with nothing, but they want that little bit of support and grip this kind of thing is interesting, and if you contact me, I can connect you to the individual. Um, I'm actually not sure if he's still making these or in business. It was like 10 years ago or more. Um, now this is a little contraption I invented, and I'm, this is a little prototype, and I'm still working on it. But it's called the K-Rest, and it's made using powerful neodymium magnets. Uh, and basically you put this pad under your clothing, uh, on your shoulder, and then this little piece would go here. So you're kind of sandwiching your clothing in between these very powerful magnets. And then you would extend this rubber band and hook it under one of the corners of the violin. So that's the only point of contact. And what it does is it pulls the instrument exactly how you would like. You get that kind of elasticity and that flexibility. So it's like every time you move the instrument in a bad direction, it gently tugs it back to the ideal. So I'm still working on this and there are a lot of kinks to iron out, but proof of concept will be demonstrated soon enough on my channel. So stay tuned for that. So as you can see, it's okay to have many stages in your setup over the years. Um, I know people that change things all the time and they're great players. So I think it's okay as long as it's mindful and purposeful and not kind of pathological. So you have to realize that you might never be 100% satisfied. Everything can be a stepping stone. You can get slightly looser. You can get slightly um, more balanced. And above all, you'll have a better understanding of how the angles work, how your body works. Um, I think that's the important thing. Never underestimate the fact that the issue might not be the gear and the accessories, but rather something in your technique that you could adjust. It's often the case that a change in your technique will simplify and clarify your setup. And I've definitely made those mistakes of trying to over-engineer solutions in my setup and ignoring what I can do to adjust my body. So here are a couple of things that I've learned in that process. As of late, one of the most important changes that I've experimented with in this regard has been to 
hold the violin more in the hand and not completely rely on the clamping to hold the instrument down. Um, it's always a balance between how much hand and how much uh, of your head is doing the work. And I think finding a balance in that regard really frees you up and knowing when you're gonna take the violin more in the hand and when you're going to provide some extra support. Um, so what that's allowed me to do, as I mentioned, was to shorten my chin rests, um, which I think is just ultimately a more natural way to play. Another way to calibrate your body in terms of setup would be to use my scroll support method. Um, you could find a video on that. I'll, I'll link it above and in the description. But basically the idea of having support under the scroll so that you can release all of the things involved in um, holding the instrument up during play and add elements individually so that you can really understand what's actually necessary to balance and support the instrument. Another important concept is the independence of the swinging of the arm that we do for, you know, whether it's shifting or various stretching, the independence of that and the shoulder. For many people, any kind of motion like this is accompanied by some sort of tension in the shoulder. So learning to have, I call it like the chicken wing, that you can move your arm around completely, um, you know, rotating from the shoulder socket and the shoulder itself is not rising. And speaking of the shoulder, if you feel like you need to support the instrument with your shoulder and you feel like you're about to tense it up like this, one thing you could do is direct that energy forward instead of upward. So it's kind of like moving your shoulder blade back a little bit. And I find that this is a far more sustainable way of activating the shoulder when you need that extra support, like during a shift or some very passionate moment in the music. Finally, and maybe most important, is how you move while you play. Obviously, there are many different ways to move while you play, and one tip is something that I picked up from uh, Ivan Galamian, which has been um, exemplified by Pincus Zuckerman in many masterclasses that you can see on YouTube. That's this idea of meeting the bow with the violin on up bows and expanding the arms on the down bow, right? It's so it's this dynamic motion where the pushing and the pulling of the down and up bows is not achieved through some kind of stationary object and then another thing that is working on it, but rather two things that are in flow that'll also help you achieve um, very graceful bow changes. And it can free a lot of tension that often arises when you're overly stable with the instrument and then you have different events happening in the bow. And depending on the complexity of that event, you're gonna get more or less tense. So this way, everything is moving together. It's like when you're petting a cat, unlike a dog, the cat will push back up into your hand, and it's that friction that creates the petting experience for the cat. Likewise, the friction that we feel with our bow on the string is the same exact thing. So in many respects, um, violin technique is all about dynamic motions and things working together, as opposed to these overly concrete conceptualizations of you know, stability and movement. So I hope that's been helpful for you. It's certainly been helpful for me uh, to actually lay out my thoughts on this topic and to physically lay out the different uh, tools that I've used over the past 10 years and to see the changes and to see the evolution of it. So I'm very curious what you've learned from your experiments with the setup, uh, what kind of products you've used, what kind of solutions you've come up with, 
and what kind of frustrations are still there. So please leave those comments down below and I'd love to start a discussion on that. Thanks for watching and see you next time.